Norwood assumes the position. Ligner waits to snap it. We wait. There's the snap. There's the kick. It's up. It is Remember That Guy, the sports podcast where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players past and present, and it's not Hall of Fame announcer Jack Buck you're listening to. It's me, Host James. Host Diaz is currently in a, a Super Bowl bender. Still going on, as far as I understand. He somehow made his way to New Orleans in all of this. Uh, I don't entirely know how that happened, so we do actually have the ghost of Scott Norwood. Uh, unfortunately, ghosts can't speak, so in addition to the ghost of Scott Norwood filling in for Diaz, we did also bring in our very special guest. Why don't you introduce yourself? That's right. It's me, the very special guest, Xavier. And I was going to say I feel bad for Scott Norwood, but I also don't know if Diaz is currently alive or in jail in New Orleans, so I might feel worse for him depending on what has happened down there. I but... mean, the ghost of Scott Norwood, he will let us know if Diaz dies. That will be the one thing that the ghost of Scott Norwood can communicate to us while he's here today. And I mean, I understand. Like, how could you not go nuts after that crazy game last night? Folks, it, the big game last night, insane. We don't need to rehash the final. We all know what happened in the final. But, uh, Xavier, I thought you might share with me what what parts of the big game really really jumped out at you. Uh, you know, my, my favorite part was when uh, Cooper Cup fumbled the ball but then punched it back out, picked it up, and then ran it back another 99 yards for a catch, fumble, forced fumble, recovery, touchdown. It was was, was beautiful. Was it not the first play in Super Bowl history to include both a fumble recovery and a lost fumble by the same player? I believe so. I think that's what they said on the broadcast. Absolutely amazing. I mean, you'd think with all the the history of the game that, that, frankly, someone would have managed it by now, back when players were not as good at football and probably fumbled all the time. (laughs) It's it's a, a great moment from the Rams. Uh, I also had a great moment with the Rams watching Eric Weddle, after all, coming out of retirement. And I think we'll forever remember this as the Super Bowl. We'll remember as the one where they legalized the backyard football power-ups. And the Eric Weddle spring-loaded sack on Joe Burrow late in the third quarter. What a game-changer to see him just entirely leap over the Cincinnati Bengals offensive line. You know, look. The offensive line for the Bengals, they got a lot of flack. They're better than they seem, but what are you going to do when Eric Weddle can just use that power up and jump 10 feet over you? Uh, So it it was great to see that. A crazy game. So since we all know what happened, feels like there's nothing else really to talk about there. Am I right, X? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure all of our viewers have seen it, so we don't want to we don't want to bore them with this. No, We're all in a Super Bowl hangover. Sorry, the big game. We're all in a big game hangover. Why don't we instead just take a nice little chaser and remember some guys, you and me, X, with, you know, some of the failings and, and successes last night. We, we woke up and Xavier and I just really decided that we needed to talk about some other postseason failings. There are you know too many to count. Every single win comes at the expense of, of someone losing in the postseason, but there are some that stand out more than others. And uh, Xavier, I would I would love to hear which one you decided really stood out to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so do you remember Nick Anderson? I don't believe that I do remember Nick Anderson. Uh, so Nick Anderson, Chicago boy, born January 20th, uh, 1968, mm-hmm. went to Simeon Academy where he was the Illinois Mr. Basketball for 1986 after leading his team to the city championship and the top national ranking uh, in USA Today. Uh, he went on to play for Illinois. His Fighting Illini team was given the nickname Flying Illini by Dick Vitale, and the 1989 team that he that he led made the NCAA Final Four. It's, so it's it's Illini? Because I'm not going to lie, I don't know that I've heard anyone ever say it out loud before. I always thought it was Illini. That sounded but, more like being derived from the state name. I mean, I would assume that the original version was probably similar to that, but when it's broadcasted currently, the anglicized American ish version is Illini. So Nick Anderson makes the final four. They did uh, lose to Michigan in the final four by two points. And that really hurts. But Nick Anderson, he went to the draft, the 11th pick in the first round by the Orlando Magic. Ooh, I'm sorry, the Orlando Magic is a bizarre franchise. Well, so the interesting thing about this is 
This was the first year of the Orlando Magic. This is their first draft pick. Nick Anderson is the first Orlando Magic player ever drafted. Oh, wow. Yes. So Nick Anderson drafted by Orlando, and like most expansion teams, they sucked. They, 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 they were bad, but then, 1992, they draft the big Aristotle, Shaquille O'Neal. The then, world's greatest Irish basketball player. <laughs> and then 1993, you know who they draft? That's uh, Penny, right? So they don't actually draft Penny. Right, right, right. It's the weird, like, one in three trade. Yes, they drafted Chris Webber. They mm-hmm. traded Chris Webber to Golden State for Penny. So now this expansion team within four years has both Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway. Along they with, got good real quick. Along with Nick Anderson, who has been their best player so far. Nick Anderson in the 92-93 season, Shaq's first season, he averages 20 points, six boards, and, and three assists. Like he, he is a very good player. I'm almost more impressed by the six boards because it feels like it would be really hard to rack up rebounds as a teammate of Shaquille O'Neal. Well, it's either really hard or it's really easy if everyone is trying to box out Shaq. That's true. Failing, and then the ball just bounces to you. It's also like pretty pretty fun to look at like his actual like stats page because his 91-92 season and 92-93 seasons, so before Shaq and after Shaq, are almost exactly the same. Both seasons, 19.9 points per game, 2.1 turnovers per game, 0.6 blocks to 0.7 blocks, 4.8 uh, 4. defensive rebounds to 4.5, 1.6 steals to 1.6 steals. It was Shaq somehow changed nothing about his game, and they still were bad until the next season. In 94-95, they finally kick off. Magic win 57 games, best record uh, in the Eastern Conference, and they won their first ever Atlantic Division title. So it took six years for the Magic to come from expansion to best in the East on the backs of Shaquille O'Neal, Penny Hardaway, and Nick Anderson. Yeah, they have a great playoff run in that. I, I don't want to step on your toes for any no, of No, no, it's fine. I mean, they, they beat MJ. And that's when MJ goes and retires his number uh, in the middle of a game one time and, and switches so, it out. So, so th- this, is, this is part of the story. Beautiful. So in the Eastern Conference semifinals, Magic faced Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan, who had recently just come back from his, from, from his retirement. At the end of game one, Michael Jordan is bringing the ball up the court with 10 seconds left. Nick Anderson comes in from behind, pokes the ball out, goes to Penny. Penny uh, feeds uh, Horace Grant, who dunks to win the game. Nick Anderson comes out after the game and says that uh, number 45 doesn't explode like number 23 used to, used to. Number 45 is not number 23. I couldn't have done that to number 23. And... I just you have to know at this point that if you're saying that about Michael Jordan, he's going to take it personally. Yeah. So Nick Anderson says that Michael Jordan doesn't look like the old Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan doesn't like that. And Michael Jordan does retire the number 45 immediately and shows up with the number 23 for the next game. He then drops 38 points on Nick Anderson's head. Technically, it was, all, it was against NBA rules for him to do that because he didn't register the fact that he was changing his number, you know, mid-playoff. But yeah. it's Michael Jordan, so, you know, what are you going to do? They just kept finding him uh, that, for that whole series because he just kept wearing 23 even though it wasn't his number. So they were, uh, they were finding him for that and his shoes every game? Yes. So I think he was getting, like, fined, like, 30 grand a game. And in, night, in night is just paying all of yeah. it. Nick Anderson does get the last laugh here because the Magic do win four games to two, despite him being stupid and antagonizing Michael Jordan, like everyone in the world has found out previously is a bad idea. This isn't the end. The Magic then go on to make it to the finals. And in the finals, they face the defending champion, Houston Rockets. Yes, they do. Yes, they do face the fucking Hakeem Olajuwon Houston Rockets. And I'm sorry to any Pacers fans who are upset that I completely skipped over the seven-game series in the Eastern Conference Finals, but it's not necessary for this discussion. So, 95 NBA Finals. 
Houston Rockets, defending champions, but had had a lot of issues during the season. They were the sixth seed. They beat the Jazz, the Suns, and then James's Spurs to make it to the finals that year. It's hey, David Robinson and Hakeem both end up with two. I I retract my earlier <clears throat> expletive about Hakeem Olajuwon. Hakeem Olajuwon's great. So then we have the finals, which is number one in the East, Orlando Magic versus number six in the West, Houston Rockets. But again, Rockets defending champions don't want to count out. Don't want to count them out. Game one, Magic are up one ten to one oh seven with just a couple seconds left, and Nick Anderson. It's fouled. Eight and a half seconds left. Robert Ory fouls him. And Anderson just has to make one of the two shots. Anderson is short on the first shot. Anderson takes some time. He's ready for a second shot. Short on the second. But he gets his own rebound. It's fouled again with 5.6 seconds left. Or 7.9 seconds left. Third shot. Back rims it. Misses. Fourth shot. Too strong again, misses, Rockets get the rebound. And at Both this times, point, man. Nick Anderson is a 70% free throw shooter. Like, he's not a bad free throw shooter. He is who they would have wanted at the stripe. The Rockets get the rebound. Kenny Smith hits a three-pointer to send the game to overtime. Uh, part of a then finals record, seven three-pointers for Kenny Smith. And the Rockets go on to win that game. 120 to 10 to 118 down in Orlando. This kills the magic. It, they, they've been very, very open about this. Anderson admitted later, I let it get to me mentally. I lost that dog in me. The dog was there, but there was no bite. Orlando's coach, Brian Hill, our, our guys were kind of broken mentally a little bit by that game. And it was very hard to get them back. Now, there was, you know, from the fans, Brick Anderson. Now who needs the shooting coach? All, 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 the, all these things, but, you know, it... I mean, Brick it was, Anderson's pretty good. Like, yeah, that's, it, it that's just good. laying there. That's very <clears throat> good. It, 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 it was pretty good. And Anderson, Anderson said, I've been in that type of situation before and pulled through it. I like to be in the situation. It just happened, and I say to myself, why did it have to happen now? They, it, they just, they never recovered. The, the magic get swept. They get dominated by the Rockets. This ends up being one of the big what ifs that could have happened because after this, the magic lowball Shaquille O'Neal in his free agency offer, and he moves over to the Los Angeles Lakers. And then Penny Hardaway is left to try to carry the team on his own, and it really crushes him as well. And, you know, we, we end up with a very down period for the Magic where there could have been, everyone at this point had expected them to be a possible new dynasty. Yeah. That just it's, never, it, never got off the ground. It's kind of like the 2016 Cubs if the 2016 Cubs hadn't gotten that one championship. Like, you have all this, you think, like, okay, yeah, now, now we're loaded. Like, this finals appearance, and now we're good for, like, the next few years. And it, you just watch it then slowly implode in front of you, getting worse and worse progressively at a constant rate. And... Man, what a difference one game can make. Because, yeah, you probably don't care about any of that if you still at least get a ring out of it. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because uh, I saw an interview with, with Nick Anderson from 2020 where oh, he called into a podcast, the Scoop B podcast, and was talking, was talking on it. And he said, oh, when I missed those four free throws against Houston, I would be lying on the other end of this phone to tell you that it didn't affect me. It affected me because I'm out there trying my best and it didn't happen. Look at the stage I was on at the time. I was young. Did it affect me? I'm man enough to say, yes, it did affect me in some ways. I started questioning my ability and all that. I started questioning, do I want to shoot this shot? I admit it, I didn't. But instead of me working on it, I let it get the best of me. And then, like I said, I'm man enough to admit this. I should have gotten some type of therapy for it. I should have. I never did. That's cool to hear him acknowledge the importance of athletes getting looked at when they make these mistakes. We always pile on people when these things happen and i understand it's a natural thing to like be upset but i have since honestly since the the thing that i'll talk about uh in a little bit i've i'm always very happy to know that someone is taking care of the mental health of the people that fail on those big stages and you know after this like you can you can see in his game that it's really affecting him because 
Again, I told you he was a 70% free throw shooter before mm-hmm. before this happened. By the 96-97 season, he shot 40% from the free throw line. And he, he just he just couldn't couldn't hit them. You know, he his his scoring his scoring goes down. Uh you know, he ends up going to Sacramento and then bouncing around to Memphis. And nothing nothing good happens if you end up in Sacramento at some point in the NBA. Yeah. But, you know, he he did. He has recovered now. Like for, he, he he's open about it now. He acknowledges it. He works for the Magic as a community ambassador, uh, uh, regular at Magic Games. He's still considered like one of the best Magic players of all time, uh, because again, he he was there from the beginning for ten years. And you know, obviously, if we're saying players who are the best in Magic history. Shaq is going to be number one, but he did leave, so Magic fans aren't as happy with Shaq as they might have been. One and- thing I'll say, I think if the question is who's the best NBA player to ever suit up for your team, and like whoever had the best individual season, yeah, Shaquille O'Neal probably wins. But if you were to say, like, stack up the full volume of what you did for the franchise, I might put Dwight Howard over Shaquille O'Neal. Dwight's up there too because honestly, Dwight might have done more because that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he did more with the magic. <clears throat> I don't think Dwight Howard's as good as Shaquille O'Neal. I want to make that very clear. I am not yeah. trying to say that inflammatory take, but equal number of trips to the finals. That's a, yeah. So in terms of like their production of the, with the franchise, yeah. Just because I'm thinking about the the '95 finals and the in in the 2009 finals, we we talked about how. In '95, it's the, the 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 three main characters are Shaquille, Penny, and Nick Anderson. Yeah, and there's look, no one else on that. If you look at that 2009 team, team Hito Turkoglu, I think, is on Cor- that team. Courtney Courtney Lee, JJ yeah. Redick, Hito Turkoglu, Jameer Nelson. Like, no, there's nobody on that team. Uh, J- I JJ Redick. Okay, <clears throat> JJ Redick. I did forget that he was on there. You've got one sharpshooter. JJ's never been an All Star, so that. The only all-star on that team is Dwight Howard. That makes perfect sense when you say it. That does feel like one of those players who, by the end of his career, should have been able to like fill up the XP bar enough for it to count as an all-star appearance. I think that's a thing that should exist in sports. I think there should be some players who, like, if you hit certain benchmarks... Even if you don't make an all-star game, like at a certain point you get to say, yeah, but I was an all-star level player. Like there should be an all-star level that people can hit so that even if they don't ever get that honor, they can still say it. It's interesting. We're, we're getting at a tangent now, but I just saw that Hito Turkoglu actually was their, lead, their leading scorer during, during the 2009 finals, which is absolutely nuts. I don't know how that happens. I mean, you lose four games to one. That's how that happens. Yeah, it's not great. Hey, they got you know what? The Orlando Magic have won a game in the NBA Finals. There are some franchises that still to this day cannot say that. So <laughs> that's totally fair. But uh, so the last thing I, I want to say, uh, just a little little Nick Anderson anecdote. He was interviewed by the Orlando Sentinel. This is this is an older interview. This is like this is 2015. This was for the 20th and like they they contacted him about, uh, for the 20th anniversary of. Of the, of the finals game for a retrospective yeah so this is this is interesting like anderson says quote i always gave 110 percent, and after that people made a mockery of it i felt like i was a scapegoat it's rare to hear a hint of, of anger in anderson's voice today you don't see failure on his face he has learned to live with the free throw demon by looking at the big picture after all he got a chance to play in the finals for better or worse and with the magic for 10 of his 13 years in the nba i just learned to stay strong because there are a lot of people who don't even know my story he said Anderson knew what he'd overcome, surviving a drug and gang war growing up in Chicago. A twist of fate kept him out of the path of a bullet that killed his best friend, Ben Wilson. Missing four free throws is hardly a tragedy. He says that at, sometimes he's even able to joke about it. He brought up the time he was a guest speaker at a local youth camp. Quote, I'd say, you have 10 seconds left and you need to make four free throws. I can't shoot it for you because I already missed four. <laughs> kids have no clue what I'm talking about. But the parents, the older people, they know about it. I've heard the chuckles. <laughs> I mean, that's good. Do do try and laugh at yourself. And the last part, I don't think I can ever get over it, but you learn. I've had to learn to handle it. It's like that Magic Johnson dub commercial where he says he's comfortable in his own skin. I'm comfortable in mine now. 
I feel like there's a lot of different examples of people talking about being comfortable in their own skin that you could think of other than a Magic, Magic Johnson, Johnson dub, dub commercial. commercial. I mean, it's hey, really good. do what you're going to do, man. Like, do you, but that's that's a weird pull. Good for you, Nick Anderson. <laughs> I just love that that's where his, his, his mind went first. But Nick Anderson, a very good player, never the best player, but... One of, one of the most important Magic players who happened to have the worst possible experience that yeah. really crushed, like, that team was really good. And they, they, were, have, they, probably they, were, won. they were crushed by those misses. If he makes one of those, they might win a series that they then later got swept for nothing. They and Shaq maybe never leaves, game. and maybe yeah. Shaq never leaves Orlando. Like, and maybe Kobe's in Char- stays in Charlotte. Who knows? Yeah. Like this Tim is Duncan one of the biggest ten straight championships. <laughs> it's one of the biggest what ifs that could have happened. But you know, God, the Spurs would have absolutely owned the Western Conference forever if that happened. <laughs> Maybe Vladi Divac and the Kings break through for one, but otherwise, it's it's a decade of silver and black, baby. So Tim Duncan is the new Bill Russell. More or less. Well, uh, unfortunately, no. we don't live in that world, so. It's, I, well, I'll have to settle for knowing that he only has five rings. Oh, no. <laughs> Poor me. No, that's great. I really appreciate knowing that the city he f- let down came back for him. That's, that's I think, an important thing. That's, that was part of what kind of made me, me think of mine. I want to take you back for a moment, Xavier. I want to take you back to a moment. You and I were together. Diaz was there, too, before... You know, he he went crazy after this most recent big game and and went on his his alcohol-fueled walkabout. Ghost of Scott Norwood, I think you were also kind of there. (laughs) It's it's January 22nd, 2012. We, I believe, are on Willington Street in John Stein's apartment watching the AFC Championship game. And Billy Cundiff is lining up for a kick. Now, here's... I'm going to go ahead and spoil for you. Billy Cundiff's going to miss this kick wide left. Billy Cundiff will never have a kick for the Ravens again. I'm not here to talk about Billy Cundiff, though. Not here to talk about Billy Cundiff. Billy Cundiff, he's, he's got his own journeyman career. But Billy Cundiff has let plenty of people down in plenty of moments. That's why he's got a journeyman career. He's gone to all those different teams. I want to talk instead about something that happened just a couple of plays before that. Because this was a kick from fourth and one at the Patriots' 14-yard line to potentially send the Ravens into overtime for a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Just moments ago, though, they thought they were going to win this game. Because for a split second, Joe Flacco dropped an absolute dime into a wide receiver's hands in the end zone. And it, it looked as though there we were off to Super Bowl 46. But unfortunately, the defender for the Patriots was able to knock the ball out of the hands of Lee Evans. Or should I say Lee Evans the third? He is Lee Evans the third. A, a very respectable professional football player who, because of some circumstances out of his control is forever going to be the person that dropped the pass that could have sent the Ravens to that Super Bowl. He is a native of Bedford, Ohio, born in 1981. There are five NFL players nowadays uh, from Bedford, Ohio. Lee Evans is by far the most famous of them, and he was the third at the time. There is also one other very famous person from Bedford, Ohio, who went to the same high school, Bedford High School, as Lee Evans. That's Halle Berry. Halle Berry and Lee Evans the third. Yeah, they share the the hometown of Bedford, Ohio. So, you know, it's a hotbed of talent, obviously. And, Where's Bedford uh, Lee, at? Uh, it is outside of Cleveland. So it's a, a like okay. rough suburb of Cleveland. And so that's where Lee Evans III grows up as a prodigious high school athlete. In addition to football, he does do hurdles. But his main thing is football. And he is a phenomenal deep threat because of that track and hurdles training. Gets down the field, gets open. And that ends up being what gets him a spot on the University of Wisconsin football team where he goes for college his sophomore year absolutely insane 75 catches 1545 yards it was 20.1 yards per catch he had three different quarterbacks that year throwing passes to him and he still put up 1500 yards for wisconsin in his at that point at that point i would just be i would just be like okay who can throw the ball one yard in the air and then just line lee evans up as as close as possible be like okay lee just just do it well, and again, it's not so much the screens. Like, he's getting open up top. He, he, this is 
not necessarily yards after the catch. That's not Lee Evans' biggest thing. Lee Evans' biggest thing is, I'm just going to go really far. You bomb it to me, and I will be separated from my defender by the time that ball reaches me. <laughs> um, junior year, unfortunately, doesn't get too much of a chance to follow up on it because of some injuries. But senior year, it's his last season, and he does go out strong uh, as he prepares for the draft. In one particular game against Michigan State University, they win 56-21 to because he has 10 catches for 258 yards and five touchdowns. That's ridiculous. It's it's insane. <clears throat> and so he is drafted that year uh, in the 2004 NFL draft. This is the Manning, Rivers, uh, Fitzgerald draft. The non-Hall of Fame quarterback Ben Roethlisberger is also taken in this draft. And 13th overall, Mr. Lee Evans III, taken by the, do you know? Bills, right? Yes, exactly. The Buffalo Bills. It was the highest they'd ever taken a receiver since Jerry Butler in 1979. Do you know the only other receiver other than the Jerry Butler taken higher by the Bills? Oh, Sammy Watkins? Exactly. Sammy Watkins taken yeah. uh, three years later. So that's Lee Evans. Lee Evans III, he had always worn the number three uh, in high school and college. This is before the modern cool number era that we have now entered in the NFL where anyone can wear anything, which I'm all for, but he could not wear three. He was originally given 84. He wanted to get 83. That had been unofficially retired for Andre Reed, part of those Bills Super Bowl teams. He had to Fair. get permission from Andre Reed to wear the number 83, but Andre Reed gives it to him. And, and Lee Evans does not let him down. Lee Evans is a very productive receiver for the Buffalo Bills. As a rookie, he goes for 843 yards on 43 catches. He also sets the still-standing Bills rookie wide receiver record for nine touchdowns. Bills are 9-7. and seven. Unfortunately, that is only good enough for third in the AFC East. That is also the best record that the Bills will ever have during Lee Evans' tenure in Buffalo is, at 9-7. Is, and seven. is that the year the, the Jets won the, lead, won, won the division? I think that might be the, the one year the Jets won the division. Oh, no, that was the, I'm thinking of a different year, but the Jets did finish second in, in that year. It did, yeah. did do okay. Yeah, so they, they finished below the Jets, <clears throat> and the larger problem for Lee Evans' career in Buffalo is the other team they finished behind, which is the New England Patriots. That's that's the issue, you know, for, I'm, I don't have to tell you, that's the yeah. issue for most good <laughs> players in the AFC yeah. East for like a decade and a half there. And again, Lee Evans... Very good player. He continues to be that kind of deep threat that he has been. His career yards per catch is 15.8. So he's still an excellent deep threat for the Bills, but there's only so much the Bills can do when they are playing behind Tom Brady every year. Starts to get better once wide receiver Eric Moulds moves out of town in his third season. He's going to put 1,292 yards and eight touchdowns. And in that season, he also sets a couple very fun records. Most yards for a Bills receiver in a quarter with 205 at one point. And then 265 yards in that game. That is also a record for the Bills. He also sets the NFL record. He's the only player to ever have 280-plus touchdowns in one quarter. He has two 83-yard touchdown receptions in a quarter against the Houston Texans. So he has a phenomenal season does not make the Pro Bowl. He never makes the Pro Bowl in his career, but I had to look at this one and see, like, okay, this looks like it might have been the one time he was snubbed. The four Pro Bowl AFC wide receivers were Andre Johnson, Chad Johnson, Marvin Harrison, and Reggie Wayne. That's actually a very legitimate four. Yeah, that's pretty good. That, that's yeah, pretty it was good. just like, oh, wow, that's how loaded it was at that point. So I don't think we can call that a snub, but that's, this that's is all to say, Lee Evans having a good career, the Bills not having a good time. Like I said, that 9-7 and seven in third was their best finish that they were going to have win record wise. They then have three more third place finishes to start his career. They finally get up to second in 2007. However, in 2007, they are second place with a seven and nine record and the Pats are 16 to no. So can, can I tell you something that I, please, I, I just looked yeah. this up that I really want to know. So from 2000 to 2019, it was the Patriots 17 times uh, winning the AFC East. And the only times there were uh, anyone else was the 2000 Miami Dolphins, pre-Tom Brady, mm -hmm. the 2002 New York Jets. Can I guess the last one? I yes. want to say <clears throat> it's... Because it's the year after 16-0. It's the 2008 Miami Dolphins. Yes, the Chad Pennington Dolphins. So <laughs> Is that when Chad Pennington gets his MVP vote? Yes, that, that is, that's the year that Chad Pennington gets his MVP vote. <laughs> I mean, hey, if you beat the Patriots for the division at this point, that pretty much is deserving of an MVP vote, I think. But, uh, because the, uh, Lee the, Evans certainly ain't getting it done. The year that I was talking about earlier that I got confused in 2004 was 2002. This is the year, the, the only year that the Jets won the East. 
This is the standings. Jets, 9-7. and seven. Patriots, 9-7. and seven. Dolphins, 9-7. and seven. Bills, 8-8. Eight and eight. Wow. <laughs> and the Jets are the only one to make the playoffs on tiebreaker. No one else Amazing. makes the playoffs. All well, okay, good. I don't want any above. more of those like mediocre teams making the playoffs. Only one team should make the playoffs from that crew. <laughs> Lee Evans is not making the playoffs this whole time because after that second place finish, they then drop to fourth place for his last three seasons in Buffalo. This all culminates in 2010. Unfortunately, on December 10th of 2010, he is playing against Cleveland. He tweaks his ankle and a move to the injured reserve. He doesn't know it at the time, but it is the end of his Buffalo career. He's not oh. going to play anymore for the Bills, so he finishes his full Buffalo career with 377 catches, 5,934 yards, 43 touchdowns. These are all still top five marks all time for Bills receivers. Like He's up there. You know, Stephon Diggs will rise up the leaderboards if he remains there. Sammy Watkins has some spots up there. Andre Reid, but Lee Evans is very much like a, a productive longtime Bills receiver and still a big fan favorite there but he never makes the playoffs. We're talking about playoff failures, so clearly there's a team that he needs to move to. And in that offseason, he is traded to the Baltimore Ravens for a fourth-round pick that goes on to be used for cornerback Ron Brooks. No one in particular, but he has taken one pick after the Eagles take Brandon Boykin and two picks after a player named Nick Toon is drafted. <laughs> there's, there's Nick Toon in the NFL at one point. So Lee Evans comes to Baltimore. This is during a, a beautiful run in, in Baltimore Ravens history, something that will always remain very close to my heart. This is year four of the Flacco Harbaugh era. I don't know that I've ever seen uh, in football, it, maybe there is, and I'm just a little bit biased, but it's, it's a very perfect progression, it always felt like. Like, they had a good rookie season that came up short, they had a couple more that came short, but it seemed like there was improvement year over year. You know, we were always winning at least one road playoff game that first year. They take two against the Titans and the Dolphins. They uh, beat the Chiefs on the road at one point that one year where the Chiefs win the AFC West, even though the Chargers had the number one ranked offense and defense because they had like the 28th ranked special teams or something. That's what the Chargers do. Yeah, That's what the Chargers do. They're the only team to ever rank first in both of those categories, and they miss the playoffs. An absolutely insane season. That's right. Phillip Rivers has other stuff going on. Anyway, they... they Keep getting better and better this particular year. They're able to finish 12 and 4 and win their division. And that's huge because this whole time, you know, they've gone 4 and 3 so far in these first three years of the Flacco Harbaugh era. Great playoff record. During that time, their road record has been 4 and 3, which is the exact same record because they've played seven road playoff games in three years. They have not hosted a single playoff game until this season when Lee Evans comes. I want to make it clear this is not because of Lee Evans. Lee Evans' total in the regular season is nine catches for 74 yards. Not a particularly productive time. He <laughs> misses most of it with injuries, but he stays on there. We're the Ravens. We've never been particularly deep at wide receivers. So you're someone that's put up a thousand yard season at some point and you're willing to play for us. You will line up on the field at some point. And he does get a chance to finally make to the playoffs for the first time when we host after our week one bye as the number two seed in the NFL we get to host the Houston Texans. And this is like the Matt Shaw of Houston Texans. Remember the Matt Shaw of Houston Texans? Yes. That was a bizarre run. And guess what? The, the person that this game actually really revolves around, this particular game, is future Ravens playoff hero, Jacoby Jones. Jacoby Jones is playing for the Houston Texans in this game. And he wins the game for the Ravens, essentially, as a Houston Texans player because he returns six punts in total. He loses a fumble on one of those. He muffs another one, and he ends up with four total yards for punt returns. That is a .7 per return average. Jacoby Jones, like, almost single-handedly gave that win to the Ravens and then signs with them in the offseason and goes on with them the next year. Uh, so you're but, saying he had a deal in place already and threw the game intentionally for the Ravens. I'm not saying that, but I'm not not saying that. <laughs> uh, I do want to point out, though, that at one point, in the third quarter. Ravens are only leading 17-3. Still a little in question. Third and five from the Houston 39. You really want to put some points up here. And with that third and five, Flacco goes deep and Evans reels in a beautiful 30-yard first down to bring them into the red zone. His first ever postseason target and his first ever postseason catch. So we win 20 to 13. Ravens fans everywhere are thrilled. I remember being there. It was great to finally get to see the team in the playoffs. We just hadn't gotten that experience yet. 
And the good news is what had been our kryptonite in our first couple runs was running into Pittsburgh Steelers and not Hall of Fame quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. This year, we had something lucky. We won the division. We weren't going to have to face them. Unfortunately for Lee Evans, we were going to face a common problem for him, and that was Tom Brady in the AFC Championship game. We were going up to Foxborough. We were not scared of Foxborough. I want to make that very clear about Ravens fans. We'd already at this point won our first playoff game in Foxborough when we put up 27 points in the first quarter and just drubbed them for the rest of the day. Uh, Another game that my dad decided to attend, and apparently he shared his flask with a bunch of Patriots fans, and it was empty by the first quarter because they were sad. And the Jets had just beaten the Patriots in Foxborough in the playoffs the year before then. Exactly. This was, there was not the inevitability that maybe Tom Brady carried later on in his career. We were feeling pretty good coming into this game. So we head on up to Foxborough. Early on in the game, Lee Evans is going to get his second ever target. So he's now two for two in playoff targets. This one is like a little five yard reception that ends up being a drive that comes short. It's a pretty boring game early on. Early in the second quarter, it's just been a field goal from each team. So it's three, three. Things start to get going at this point. Evans gets targeted again on a big drive. Uh, This time it is another deep ball. He reels in for 20 yards. That makes him now three for three in his postseason career for targets and catches. And during that drive, it'll get capped by Torrey Smith catching a touchdown. That makes it a tie 10-10 game. One more Goskowski field goal before halftime. It's 13-10 as we come out of the tunnels. Gets a little bit worse for the Ravens. We're down 16-10 now after another one. It's third and 11. This is an enormous drive at this point. We're on our own 40. This time, Evans, we've said he's the deep threat. You were like, oh, let's just throw a wide receiver screen for Evans every single time in college. (laughs) And look, long term, Lee Evans' play style is not going to support that. But this one time, he gets it just in front of the line of scrimmage to the right and takes it a whole nother 13 yards, keeps the drive alive. This will eventually also end with another Torrey Smith touchdown, and that will put us up on the Patriots for the first time, 17-16. What a guy Torrey Smith is. Torrey Smith is an absolutely beloved guy. And if Diaz and I were here, we would both just be able to talk about his beautiful Super Bowl runs with both of our teams. I mean, Scott Norwood's ghost is nodding at me right now. Again, I am sorry that you can't speak Scott Norwood's ghost. Uh, but Scott Norwood's ghost also knows what's coming up. And it's not beautiful. Uh, now, here's the good news. Billy kind of does kick another field goal later on. <laughs> now, Ravens 20, New England 16. He gets a chance to do that because of Danny Woodhead fumbles a kickoff return. At this point, we're up 2016. We are certain we're going to beat the Patriots because here's what's going to happen. Yeah, Tom Brady's going to do Tom Brady stuff. He drives down the field. He does give the Patriots the 23-20 to lead. We knew that was coming. But now we got the ball, and it's January Joe. I want to remind people, Joe Flacco was a good playoff quarterback. He's an elite quarterback. He's elite. January Joe is. January Joe very specifically is. He had won his previous game in Foxborough as a playoff quarterback with like 50 yards passing because Ray Rice just ran over them all game. He did not have to do that. He was slinging it this game. He's absolutely slying and that moves us down the field. We're feeling good because at this point, we've gotten down the field. It's pretty late in the game. Worst case scenario, if the drive stalls, we're going to tie it and our defense has forced several turnovers. For one, there's at one point a Joe Flacco interception that on the very next play is erased by a Tom Brady interception. Uh, So it's, the defenses are slugging, and we know if we score, we can hold up. Mm-hmm. And so we get to the 14-yard line. It is second and one, and Lee Evans runs a corner route. Lee Evans, who I want to remind you at this point, is four for four now in his playoff career for catching his targets. Lee Evans makes it five for five as he reels in a beautiful dime from Joe Flacco. But there's a guy named Sterling Moore who is right behind him. Sterling Moore goes to break it up. It's debatable whether Lee Evans had gotten two feet down in the end zone at that point. Uh, I personally think that he did, but obviously no one in the moment believed that he did. And so for that reason, he does drop a surefire touchdown. Because of that, he is forced to walk on back to the line of scrimmage where, I want to be fair, they then also fail on the next play with a Dennis Pitta short right attempt to convert on a third and one from the 14-yard line. Can't put all of this on Lee Evans. Like, there was no reason that we could not pick up the first down from there. We should have been able to take a couple more stabs at the end zone. Of course, the play that everyone truly remembers is what happens on fourth and one. Billy Cundiff, who had always kind of been a kickoff specialist versus a field goal specialist, there are several times in Billy Cundiff's career where he's on teams that have two place kickers because he specifically just does the kickoffs. He actually has the tied record for most touchbacks in a season in the NFL. So he's got a boot. 
he doesn't have the most accurate boot. And it goes left. Patriots kneel for the final play. They go on to thankfully lose, at least, to the New York Giants in the Super Bowl. But that is Lee Evans' last professional catch. He goes to the Jacksonville Jaguars for training camp the next year. Doesn't break camp. Retires at that point. And so, like, I hear you ask, sure, Lee Evans, that sounds like a heartbreaking moment. But that doesn't sound particularly special. Why bring this up? Well, I will tell you, dear listener. Lee Evans III today still lives in Northern Virginia. And he still loves the Ravens. In a way that, frankly, I don't think I could personally do if I was known for this. I remember the next year watching the Super Bowl, and in the the lead-up to it, Lee Evans was getting a lot of interview time because he was not an active player at this point anymore. And you know what? It was a pretty similar roster, so we knew almost everyone on there. In fact, that last playoff run, you know, famously at the beginning of the Super Bowl 47 run, Ray Lewis announced it was going to be his last ride. That was great news to Lee Evans because Lee Evans' first thought when he dropped that pass after that game was, I just cost Ray Lewis a chance at another Super Bowl. Uh, he went up to Ray Lewis and like apologized, thinking this might have been his last season and like, couldn't take it away. But Ray Lewis uh, very, very much talks about this galvanizing moment in the locker room following that year. After that loss, has everyone together and says, this is you know, a moment that's going to make us stronger. And... We come back the next year, and thanks to some deer antler spray that took care of uh, Ray Lewis's bicep, he leads the defense <laughs> to a uh, goal line stop on fourth down. We, we win the Super Bowl. It is sad that Lee Evans couldn't be a part of that, but that whole five-year stretch from the beginning of Flacco and Harbaugh is kind of considered one roster sometimes, I feel like, in Ravens fans' mind. like Everyone that had a hand on the ball at some point during that run represents it and that's something that i think is really beautiful about like when a team makes a championship run you know aj green has been uh talking to people ahead of this Bengals super bowl because if they win aj green is 100 percent a part of this Bengals team that's going on like he was there for all those years prior to that there's so many guys on that roster that played with him andrew whitworth who they're playing against is a part of this Bengals team and I think that's something that really stood out to me. And I also wanted to mention that like Lee Evans is not alone in being a Raven that came up short that loves this franchise after coming there late in his career. Eric Weddle, playing this week, said in interviews leading up to it, you know, he loved his time in Baltimore. He lived there full time when they were there. They weren't split in time between their Southern California home and the, the East Coast. They were there. He's been called by the owner, Steve Bishotti, Eric DaCosta talked to him this week. Just all of the Ravens in their love. I, all Baltimore fans pretty much are rooting for the Rams because of Eric Weddle, to be totally mm-hmm. frank. And other guys that play with us now, Marcus Peters and Calais Campbell are both guys who've said, you know, this this team really kind of rejuvenated my love of the sport. This organization got me back into it. Justin Houston said that. And then guys like Anquan Bolden and Steve Smith that have come through before. You know, Lee Evans is is a longtime fan favorite and legend in Buffalo. The thing that he's most notable for in Baltimore is fucking up. And yet, he's probably one of the 10 players I think of first when I think of the Super Bowl run, and he wasn't even on that roster. I just really love the way that everything that went wrong doesn't feel like it's wrong anymore after things finally go right. Great for Lee Evans is that not only did someone else fuck up worse than him afterwards. There's that. And then get replaced by the greatest place kicker in NFL history. Uh, So that kind of overruled that. But then the Ravens won the Super Bowl next year. And I got to see you run out on the Montgomery track screaming and yelling and being happy and I feel like once that got off everyone's back, even though Lee Evans wasn't on that team, it still kind of banished the demons from the year before and made everything 100%. feel like it's not like the Magic, who have still never won a title. And it's like, you know, it takes a lot more to kind of deal with the, that failure. The Ravens are a great team and a great organization who win. It's, it's the not same like the Jets like- when we lost the two straight AFC Championship games. And it's like, okay, will we ever get back there in my lifetime? It's like, no, the Ravens lost that game. Like, the Ravens will be back. We know yeah. the Ravens will be back. And they it's, won the Har Bowl. Well, no, <laughs> we won the Har Bowl the 2011 season because they played each other on Thanksgiving. The Niners and the Ravens in Baltimore, that was dubbed the Har Bowl because we were like, okay, this is two brothers playing against each other in a game. We don't think this will ever happen again. 
That is why the next year when the Super Horror Bowl happened, it was even <laughs> more insane. Um, but I couldn't agree more. Like it's, I, I say all the time when I talk about the Spurs, like watching Ray Allen kill us in 2013 is probably the most crystallizing moment of my Spurs fandom versus then coming back and winning the next year. Like winning was amazing. So glad that coming late to that team and late to that dynasty, I wasn't there watching any of the other four, but I got to see that one part of this run and it just makes me uh, appreciate all the more that I got to also watch some, some of the heartbreak. It, it makes it worth it. Winning's not yeah. worth it if you always win. When you know how bad it feels to not get that, it feels all the much better. You know, that's, that's really all I have to say about Lee Evans. It's not you know, a deep story. It's just, I think, a, a guy who got one shot at it and came up short and still finds a way to, despite that, be looked back on fondly by the people that once upon a time might have thought that he let them down. But instead, he was just setting us up for even better success the next year. Fuck you, Tom a, Brady. <laughs> that was a great story, James. I, I really like uh, I, I, I forgot that it was Lee Evans who, who dropped that. I mean, I remember that because obviously... I was there watching it with you, but I forgot that it was Lee Evans who dropped that pass. The, the silence with which I stood up, said goodbye to John Stein after that Billy Cundiff kick, and then just left without speaking to anybody else. And the thing is, like, I had been in that position the year before. Yeah. Like, the exact year before, Antonio Brown gets big third down conversion to beat the Jets when it looked like the Jets were going to make the greatest comeback in like AFC championship game history. And it's like, so I knew exactly how you were feeling, but I can tell like, nope, just, just leave James alone. Yeah. Leave leave James alone. Dear listener, I exited that home quickly. (laughs) Now here's the, you know, I I don't think without the council, we can fully induct all these, these individuals. And unfortunately the ghost of Scott Norwood does not have any input on this, uh, on this. So, you know, actually ghost of Scott Norwood, how would you feel about being brought into the hall of guy instead? Oh, I'm being informed actually by Ghost of Scott Norwood that this is a completely different Scott Norwood. I, I didn't know that Scott Norwood was still alive. We booked the wrong Scott Norwood. So <laughs> actually, was... we're just we're just going to totally move on from that case. I, this is just some dead guy named Scott Norwood. Uh, so that's embarrassing. I'm sorry, everyone, uh, for all of I'm sure he liked the company. So it's. I mean, I certainly enjoyed his. Uh, maybe now he can go out and, and find our dearly debauched friend, Diaz. But we'll go ahead and save our induction into the hall for the next time. I have one thing I'd like to say before we head out. There's an individual with a British IP address who has listened to every single episode of this show in like the last 30 days. I would just like to know, hi, who are you? Please hit me up. Nothing is. I'm just genuinely curious. Who are you? Please come find us. We'd love to have you on sometime. I don't know. Tell us about a fun British guy that we don't know. But that's the only other thing that I have. Do you have anything else before we we head out this evening, my friend? Nothing for me. All right. Well, in that case, uh, without any sign-off, I'm James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. And uh, as Scott Norwood would say, this episode was Guy Right. (laughs) 